Welcome back, everybody. This is Brian and Brian on uh, Breaking Down Security. Yep, that's us. Today we're going to be talking about malware. Malware, ooh, big bad word. That's right, scary stuff. So, uh, well, part of the part of the podcast this week is going to be us interviewing Michael Goff. He's a researcher, works for MI2 Security. Uh, him and his partner Ian Robertson has created a tool called the Sniper Forensic Toolkit, which he will talk about during the interview. I think before we do the interview, and, and you know, we're going to talk about some terms uh, that may come up during the interview. What uh, we have a whole list, actually. What, what was the first one we we're going to talk about? Well, just malware in general, right? What is sure. malware? Well, <clears throat> can be. Uh any type of hostile software like viruses, worms, spyware, what else? Adware, ransomware, key loggers, key loggers, yeah, just uh anything nefarious, right? Right. Bad software meant to do uh a malicious intent. All right. Um Advanced persistent threat. We're going to talk about that as well. What is advanced persistent threat? Advanced persistent threat is a group, uh, individuals, or a government entity. Uh, most people, when they think of APT, they think of China, but uh, the NSA and the Israeli government actually implemented an APT type attack on when they when they created Stuxnet or the Duku, yeah. uh, Duku virus. Yeah, those were so. Yeah, so APT doesn't just attack Western governments. It also attacks, um, it could attack anybody, financial centers. It can attack uh, infrastructure, SCADA. It can attack. So uh, it's like, um, you know, not just a simple piece of malware, but it's got somebody behind it and it keeps evolving, right? Somebody's uh, got a specific target they're trying to attack and it's got a lot of money and got a lot of brains behind it. That's right, and they're able to gain persistence in some method, uh, either by continually running a backdoor uh, against a, a system, or uh, installing software that allows them to continue to, you know, uh, gain, uh, you know, gain root levels to. to yeah, it's got a lot of intelli- intelligence behind it. They try and uh, hide their backdoor really well, and don't want. You know, just trying to maintain that persistence inside the environment. So another one, another term that he's going to talk about is uh, POS terminals or point of sale terminals. And, you know, you go to Target, you you know, lady runs the stuff across the scanner, pops up. The POS terminal is the little red box if you go to Target uh, that you slide your card through or the gray one or, you know, it can be it can be any little thing. Sometimes there's a pen on it where you can write your name to sign receipts that is the the bit that swipes and holds the card information to be sent to the centralized uh, server and then on to uh, credit card processors. Right, like a mini computer. Like yeah, very, very much so. Uh, embedded systems. Sometimes they're connected very simply, like those, or they're connected to the the machine on the cashier. Uh, you know that uses to ring up items, and it can um, run embedded XP, uh, Windows XP in this case for some many of them. Uh, the newer versions, I think, run a Windows Seven. Uh, but there are other systems too. Uh, I went to a, a barbecue joint this morning for breakfast, and um, they were using a, a touch a touch terminal. And I asked them what they were using, and they mentioned another company that was not Micro S, uh, Micro Mike, was it Micro OS or something? He called it. Um, yeah, I think so. A micro yeah. XP. Yeah, there's more than there's more than just uh you know that that company. There's there's several, you know, NCR right. just like with ATMs, NCR, Dbold, they make ATMs. There's numerous companies that do it, but there you know, there's only really one or two big ones that actually supply a lot of retailers with their 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 pause terminals. We call them pause in the industry as well. Okay, and I think the last thing we want to mention just before we get started is macro viruses. Now, these are viruses that are inserted into non-executables, basically the macros inside things like Windows, Microsoft, Excel, and Word. So those are a little bit harder to detect, but hopefully, uh, you know, Windows comes out with updates to their products. So they're they basically attack applications, and they aren't they don't execute themselves until. Uh, well, inside your programs. So it's a it's just a malicious bit of like VB script in an Excel document. Can be VB script, yes. Okay. 
and and wow, so VB script can be embedded in Word documents, PowerPoint, any kind of office document, mm-hmm. right? Okay. All right. So without further ado, here is malware expert Michael Goff. Yeah. Unfortunately. No. All right. There we go. All right. We're recording. <clears throat> Don't knock it over. Uh, well, okay. Well, we'll drop it down like that then. <clears throat> All right. So uh, Brian, Brian from uh, Breaking Down Security here with Michael Goff. It is Goff, right? I'm not saying it wrong. You are. I am saying it wrong? Saying it right. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I was worried about that. I hate saying people's names wrong. Um, we're here talking about malware, you know. It's a pretty big subject, obviously, malware. We're just malware, but um, welcome to the show. Thanks. Yeah. Um, we saw you speak last month at ISSA about uh, the various hacks, and at the time, Michaels was not out, but Neiman, Marcus, and Target were, I believe. Um, I think I might have said something about that. Yeah, and you said there were several other retailers that were had yet to come forward. There's about eight of them that have been, <clears throat> been you know, basically told that they have an issue and uh, we only know I think three or four right now so stay yeah. tuned yeah, are we, they part of the same yep all high use credit card fraud now is it because they all use the same POS terminals po- uh, point of sale terminals yes this uh, particular <laughs> exploit went after the uh, embedded Windows XP systems and so anybody uh, they could get access to it worked really well for them. so anybody that has that even the small mom and pa retailers would be vulnerable to this yeah and it's a basically uh, they call it a P, uh, RAM scraper, right? Yep. It just scrapes the values out of RAM. piece of memory. It watches, yeah, it's in memory. And it watches the credit card numbers go across, grabs them, and uh, off they go to the uh, nefarious <coughs> near dwellers. Now, you when you were talking about the malware the last time, you said <clears throat> one of the quick and dirty ways of getting rid of some malware is to just hit the power button for four seconds and then it goes off because a lot of malware likes to write itself back from memory before the system shuts down or it like knows there's an init sick going on or part of the part of the shutdown yeah it'll uh put itself into that piece so if you hit the power button it won't be able to write so you never see it so persistence is is that something similar with this kind of ram scraper or um it'd be interesting to test but i i know there were files involved with the black pos stuff the stuff that was on a target so persistence if you want to persist to disk obviously write to disk you want to be sneaky and stealthy one of the obvious ways to hide yourself is to write it to ram and then during the shutdown of the kernel process hook in there in such a way that you shut down last so that the tools as they shut down tripwires bit nines of the world um, don't detect you in the course of them shutting down okay and then you write back to disk and then when it boots up read into disk delete it off the disk those products never see you sure i have found and experienced one of those okay so all right, Joe, Joe user, average user, goes out and buys himself a laptop because he wants to surf the web, check email, do the Facebook. How long, now it's got antivirus pre-installed, how long before Joe gets infected? Let me rephrase that. How long before Joe's computer gets infected? Well, it depends on Joe's surfing and emailing habits, but if Joe likes to open up attachments from just about anybody or clicks on just about any URL in an email he gets or clicks on everything under the sun in Facebook, uh, within a month, easy. Yeah. If they're pretty good at not opening those things, then obviously it can be longer and longer. But I think the average user, unfortunately, doesn't know the techniques that we do in InfoSec or even some IT people. And uh, they open stuff, click stuff. It's from people I know. And poof, botnet and game over. So you're saying even with antivirus, giving him a month? Well, antivirus, let's let's look at some numbers about antivirus. So Sophos reported, and I would tend to agree with this these numbers, um, 70% of malware uh, of the roughly 110 million, 100 million pieces that were reported in uh, 2012, in 2013 it's estimated to be 160 million. So you can see the increase is wow. rather rapid. That 70% of malware is unique to one, one company. So this is a targeted type stuff. This is you know somebody coming after you, period. The 80% of malware is targeted to 10 companies or less. So it's definitely an industry going after things like gaming or defense contractors or, in this case, retailing with a target in Nima Marcus, anybody with the uh, POS scenarios. So really the antivirus companies are focusing at 20% of the malware that's out there. But the quantity is quite high. It's probably 80% of the total quantity that's out there. So when you send a, uh, an antivirus company 
some of this special malware, they don't react to it. I sent uh, samples to 12 companies, got a response from two. I think I only got a response from the second one because I knew somebody in the company. And they came back and reported that stuff was not malware when, in fact, it was very advanced APT. So, you know, malware companies just are unable to deal with the sheer volume. It's gotten to the point where signature-based defense just doesn't work. Yeah. It may get the lingering stuff, stuff you plug in the mm -hmm. thumb drive, stuff that gets discovered over time, you know, stuff that's in mass attacking people where they can actually spend some effort. Um, but for the most part, anything secret, stealthy, or, or uniquely crafted will not get detected by antivirus at all. So signature base doesn't work. What does? Um, I don't think any antivirus detection really works. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing will defect, you know, uh, will defend you and, and detect 100% of anything. Well, they, they went from signature base, which was basically a hash of the, that, that's pretty much it, a hash of the, the virus itself, which is easily gotten around by using white space or to, you know, subtly change those. Then they went to like heuristic based, right? Like noticing behavior. odd behavior, sim right. similar like a host IDS or IPS. Um, Again, a signature of, of, of a behavior. You're yeah. doing this, you're acting in this way in these sequences, so therefore you must be bad or questionable. Yeah, which is why we have so many variants. It doesn't do X this time, so yeah. it's different. Or And these kits basically compile malware. Uh, Chris <laughs> Elias at B-Sides Austin last year demonstrated a Zeus um, creator that in the course of his talk he created 30 variants of Zeus. And so from that perspective, you just can't defend with antivirus. It just yeah. doesn't work. So you have to look at something, you know, more intense on the system. You have to look at, you know, think of it as a big pile of hay. You know, Windows has 100,000 plus files on it, a typical Windows box. Uh, malware, as I mentioned before, is 110 million, 160 million. Um, what's the smaller number, the amount of files in the Windows box? Exactly. Well, most of it's Windows. 75% of the files in a box are Microsoft Windows. 25% is the programs. Mm -hmm. you know, excluding data, we're talking about executables. So if I focus on the getting rid of the good, the hay, then what's left is the bad files. And yeah. so that's the approach that we take with the Snapper Forensics Toolkit is we say, look, uh, we know how to get rid of the good stuff, so what's left that I actually have to look at? And once you get a nice clean setup, anything new shown on the box is 100%. I don't need to have, it's not a signature. It's something new that didn't belong there before. I either installed something or it got there nefariously. It's a much better approach. <clears throat> so you monitor EXEs, DLLs, bin files, any anything kind of executable, executable. Yep. or can be injected. Yeah, we, the goal here is to cut <clears throat> off the head of the snake. You sure. don't need all the pieces and parts. Once you find the head in the snake, with our toolkit, for example, you then can go in and research those locations for additional files, the logging files, additional DAT files that are unencrypted as a part of the execution. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we don't need to actually look for those. It's part of the signature of the malware. You just need to cut the head off the snake. Yeah. What about macro viruses? You mentioned executables. So there, yeah, there's lots. Um, one of the talks, someone had said, "What about browser-based stuff?" So, well, I think it's a different problem. Um, I'm not going to try to to solve everything. I'm going to solve what I think is the the biggest problem, and that's the persistence. Uh, the social engineering toolkit and Metasploit are now focusing very heavily on putting their exploits only in memory. And so, yes, to get back to how do I clean a really tricky machine, believe it or not, yanking the power is a great way to get rid of it. Because if I don't persist the disk, then when I power back up, and I've had this conversation with Dave Kennedy where, you know, as soon as the user logs off, he loses his persistence, so he better gain root access by the time that user does that sure. with some sort of method, exploitation, O-Day, whatever. And, and so the goal here is if it's a memory only, it's a different approach to looking at seeing what's there. That's, that's another focus area. It's also probably less than 5% of the total malware that's out there. It's more complicated to write it. It's, it affects the system more. But, you know, DLLs can be easily crafted, tested, and, you know, make sure that they actually don't interfere with what the user is actually doing, yeah. collect the keystrokes, <laughs> things like that. So, so you said that the stuff in memory is it's less than 5%. So it takes a really skilled kind of person who obviously must have some kind of funding or backing are, are we looking at like criminal organizations or are we looking at like people who pull it together like a Kickstarter? Hey, we're going to hack this. I've got $5,000 here. I've got, you know, I mean. Uh, it's definitely going to be somebody who's <laughs> feeding in, in this, this area. I mean, A, you don't want to announce that you have it. So it's going to be very crafted towards uh, retail or, mm -hmm. or defense contractors or the gaming industry. Anybody that, you know, has some value that they want to go after. So, yes, it's definitely got backing by organized crime of some sort. Yeah. Uh, nation state stuff. Uh, I've evaluated the Stuxnet, Flame, Duco, our Sniper Forensics Toolkit. We picked that stuff up in a minute. 
Uh, we look at those and say, oh, these are really crafty. And there's a new one called the mask. The mask, yes. And I'm, mask I'm dying to get mask. that analysis so I can look at it and say, you know, <clears> would we detect this? And really it comes down to the hardest part is if it's only running in memory, how do I, because, you know, you start taking memory dumps of a box, and you're kill, you kill the box in the process. Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's not quick. It's not yeah. efficient. But there's other ways to deal with that. Uh, VMware images, for example, a lot of companies, you know, have that environment and really don't have to worry about it. Every day, sure. cycle it off, it gets refreshed. So there's, there's lots of ways to deal with that. But servers, you're not readily doing that to your servers, so yeah. you better come up with a process to check that. Plus, scramming an entire server, you lose all the data. If it's an exchange server, for instance, you've lost several thousand emails or possibly, you know. Yep. You know, a lot all of company of may decide to stay infected if they, you know, doesn't mean they lose their data. So we, we have some stuff we're working on that we'll look at that area as well. Um, but basically, I've been involved with an Exchange server where Exchange server got some of the secret payload. Uh, none of the tools, none of the security tools, uh, pick one, detected this stuff. And it was only from memory dumps that we were able to say, you know, there it is. And so how do we get rid of it? And shut all the services down, shut down Exchange, shut down all the database, shut down everything, and then just pull the power of the box and then power it back up, and it was gone. Because that's what they rely on. Yeah. And in if it's memory only, it has a weakness. And believe it or not, that's, you know, <coughs> maintenance yeah. for your servers. Exactly. Occasionally, <laughs> just pull the plug. Pull the plug. <laughs> nice. How lucrative is the malware business? I mean, for the bad guys. Obviously very lucrative. Um, in gaming, you know, they're constantly being attacked in the gaming industry. We read about these things. There was a big attack just going after one gamer over Christmas and New Year's, for example. But Crypto Locker, just a Crypto couple Locker. months of Crypto Locker was nailing people. Uh, the estimates are that they those guys made forty million dollars off of the crypto locker, the first wave of crypto locker, and that tells you that it's without a doubt a very lucrative and profitable business, and that also tells everybody, oh, that's a lot of money. If I could make twenty five percent of that, I'd be really happy. And so yes, we're going to start seeing a lot more of this <coughs> ransomware destructive type stuff. And so now, uh, you know, us as defenders and, and infosec people have to learn how to defend or detect against this threat. And I don't think there's anything you can do for an end user in training that's going to tell them, you know, don't click on that because you can just be surfing a website and get it. Yeah. And the question is, can you in your environment detect it fast enough you can stop it from doing complete destruction? So you mentioned detection. <coughs> I mean, let's talk detection versus, um, you know, prevention, like IPS versus IDS. Where, where are your loyalties? My loyalties are I'm going to give up the endpoint. Bottom line is I'm not going to spend a lot of money on a lot of AV or IDS tools on the endpoint to say, uh, I can stop this from hitting this person's box. Unless you're willing to cut off the internet and block all attachment types of any kind of executable and completely disable your business line in the process, you basically have to assume that that box is going to get compromised. So from that perspective, a detect and response is the way to deal with it. You know, these things, these files ended up in locations, CryptoLocker. CryptoLocker utilized the user's app data roaming directory. There are no executables in that directory. So if you monitor that directory alone and local low and, ro and uh, local local low and roaming and, and the app data directory, those three directories, if you monitor for new executables, you're going to get a lot of the user's downloaded malware or drive-by surfing malware. So detect that. Look for those conditions. And don't worry about antivirus being good enough. It'll get some of the straggler stuff back and forth. Uh, quite common, they, they associate good malware and bad malware. They put the good malware in there, the stuff that won't get detected. So as to fool you, when the antivirus goes off and says, I found this malware, you go, yay, and you move on to the next thing, when in fact there's actually a super secret piece on there. And I have experienced one of those as well. So detection is definitely where to go. Um, just... Just wait, just wait and see what happens after the box. And don't put data on those boxes. Make sure it's on the network in some way, form, or manner. Yeah. What about non-Windows malware? How, how concerned should we be? Uh, like, for example, uh, Mac or Linux? Uh, well, I've also dealt recently with some Linux malware, and it, it exploited the uh, struts vulnerability. And uh, unfortunately, when you get a Nix uh, rootkit, it's total ownage. And it's very stealthy in regards to finding it. You literally have to do a comparison of what's in memory to what's in the slash proc and find what's hiding because slash proc has to be where they put the executable call but they hide all of it and so you basically have to crawl through all the PIDs one at a time is slash proc one there yep is slash one in memory yep go on to the next one is slash you know 10,412 in proc yep is it memory nope ah flag it and it's really quite painful to have to do it. You just grep, right? You just Pretty much. Grep and knock it. Grep and knock, yeah. Yep. 
and uh, you can and, script something up like that in an afternoon. Yeah, you problem could. solved. I've got a script I can give you. <laughs> so uh, from that perspective, the ownage is much higher, and it's pretty much complete takeover. In the case of these, they're web servers sitting on the internet, uh, really bad condition. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's tough. But it is a higher skill set. You're messing with the kernel. You potentially are bending the box. It's it's a much different duck. It's not skiddies. It's, it, it, yeah, they're not yeah. they're not script kiddies doing this stuff. It's people that you know are definitely crafting some good wares and have tested it. And though the target is much smaller, the risk of detection and, and getting infiltrated is much higher. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, yes, keep your stuff patched if it's facing the internet and find some clever ways to detect that. And there's a, there's a cross-platform Java vulnerability right now for Mac, Windows, and Linux. So if you're running an old version of Java, they, they've written one. Or just running Java. Or just so running Java yeah. in general. Yeah. yeah, I don't do that. <coughs> Oracle still does not sponsor our podcast, probably never will. <laughs> Um, and neither Adobe. Adobe. <laughs> so you say the, the target breach would have never happened on your watch. Yes. How can you be so confident? I mean, you know what you're up against, right? $40 yeah. million dollars here, you know. Oh, that's going to be in the, that's I mean, be the hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars in profit, I'm yeah. sure, from the, when it comes to, when I mean, somebody given, finally calculates what they think the criminals made on that one. Given it's not what just you're target. up against, I mean, wh how are you so confident? Well, let's look at, let's look at, uh, what we know so far. So we, we know that a, that a partner got compromised and somehow that had something to do here. So everybody who's got a partner on their network needs to understand that is a vulnerable point for you. What do you allow that partner to do? If you don't isolate a partner in that anywhere they go, call it, I call it bubbling your network. It's you know segmentation and everything else. But bubbles are a better term because you may not be able to segment some of the things in bubbles. Uh, let's take the POS systems in general. They're a bubble. They have data coming in, whatever that may be, management, what have you, and they have data going out. Pretty deterministic what the data coming in and the data going out. I'm pretty sure my partner has no business being on my POS, being inside my POS bubble. Yeah. So there would be there would be rules to segment <laughs> that or keep those two bubbles separate. But POSs are also incredibly dumb devices. They're static as can be. Uh, if you're not running whitelisting softwares or solutions like ours on them, I mean, these things don't change. Any change whatsoever on those POSs are, is so easily detectable, either in a log scenario, if you, if you log it well, turn on, enable the logging, or use some sort of configuration management, any change to that system would have flagged that. And it's, it's something you really don't have to do. Once you set it up, it's done, because it's static. It's never going to change. Look in these directories, look on these settings, boom, done. So from that perspective, um, just those two things alone, a partner network, making sure they don't touch anything more than they have to, Looking at these dumb devices, being very static, configuration management works really well. It's a great area for something like a Bit9 or our product. Once you baseline this thing and you, you basically have no results, any malware shows up in that box and gets written to disk will set off every alarm in the house. Yeah. So from that perspective, this is really basic stuff. It's on large scale with Target. I get it. But uh, that really is not, not at all wise. Now, granted, if I worked at Target, probably wouldn't have been able to stop it because of the behemoth the size of these companies are. Yeah. Now... The talk you gave that I was at a few weeks ago, you talked about uh, this APT that, that infected your company or that you were researching how it worked and it was, you know, changing the way it did things. Um, were you really that big of a target? Uh, the industry I was in formerly, yes, they're, they're a constant target. There's but, a lot of money in that industry and, uh, and they harvest and mine data in order to get to the people using their products and they make a lot of money off the side. So they knew what they were after and that's why they were so persistent at it. Even though you yep. blocked them here, they would come at you from another angle or change the way. Uh, we constantly fish, not only at work, personally, personal people got fished successfully and then VPN'd in, boom, that avenue was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, emails crafted, we, we tore apart one email one time and it had been compiled 30 minutes prior to us receiving it. So they were very specific. Their timing of when they did things, very specific. Now, some of the stuff was very clever, almost laughable, like, man, this is awesome. And then at the same right. time, ah, damn it, i got to get rid of this, right? So um, double-edged sword, but they, and they evolved. As we caught them and, and defended against them, they evolved, moved to more tricky locations, uh, changed their, their mechanisms, never put the super-secret sauce memory-only malware on more than just a couple systems. Because, you know, you don't want to accidentally do it. It wasn't until we really started tearing some box parts and going to the next level of the detection that we started finding these things. And, and once you know what to look for, then obviously it's very easy to go across your environment. But they were quite 
persistent and every time we kicked it up a notch they kicked up a notch to the point where you know basically anything they did we detect period yeah now you interface with the FBI on this we did this provide them all information too. also Google and Microsoft as well to provide them some information that uh, uh, Google took immediate action and took this took the information and the sites that, that we referenced that were in Google being used yeah. immediately took them down and uh, we're still waiting to see what Microsoft does with the information we gave them how do you know it wasn't the FBI doing it, you know, <coughs> testing their new uh, uh, attack vector? Other uh, than the <laughs> super secret malware that was in memory, this stuff it wouldn't be good enough for somebody like the NSA, to be honest. I mean, Windows is so incredibly broken, it's, it's, it's really trivial for somebody to write malware for a Windows box. There's just so many ways to take it over, it's, it's mind-blowing. So you were Without <laughs> exploits or zero days. <clears throat> so for people who don't understand point-of-sale systems, Kind of like myself, I just use them. Why couldn't they have ran Windows updates when they had the ability to do that? Is it a, is it is the POS system part of Windows XP or is it just a Windows XP box with a program installed on it? It's a unique version of Windows XP. Mm -hmm. It's a modified kernel that has a specific task because it's a embedded, you know, it runs off of a chip. So okay. um, they don't necessarily need to patch these systems as much. These again are pretty static devices, and patching wouldn't have stopped this. Uh, for the most part, patching doesn't stop anything internally in an organization as far as malware goes. Um, until Microsoft solves DLL injection, there's there's no stopping this any kind of malware. Yeah. Bottom line is, if I can put a DLL next to an executable that launches in Windows or System32 or WBM or anywhere else in the box, SQL Server, executable, if I can drop a DLL, it will be called there before the proper location. Yeah. And, and until that's solved with Windows, there's no fixing this, and patches will never solve this. Well, why, did, why didn't Microsoft make it so that they couldn't install any software once they had put it on the system? I think that's Target's. You know, Target could have <coughs> set up or any of the other retailers can set up and, and use uh, AppLocker or basically you know, some sort of whitelisting capability within GPO and say that's all that can run. Yeah. And so from that perspective, you know, Microsoft gives you a product. It's up to you to configure it in your best, you know, the best way you need to configure it. Yeah. I don't think it's really up to them. I mean... Wouldn't it be nice to have a lockdown version of Windows? I'm pretty sure nobody would be able to do anything. <laughs> yeah. You say Windows is broken. Why do you use it? Everybody has to use it. All you know, industry apps are written on Windows. You have no choice but to use it. Now, a lot of us, all the, you know, do you have a Mac or a third-party OS you use? I have all three. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> so we use it where we have to. And, of course, because I, I'm involved in a malware discovery tool, uh, I love malware, and so I use it for that. But yeah. um, because all the apps you use are just there it's just it, it really is a business decision period but how confident are you using it knowing what you know do you ever get it do you ever get infected only on purpose <laughs> okay uh well you know again the, the it and the, the the geeks that like us in infosec you know we run no script and not script and ad blocker and yeah. web of trust and various other things some of us run emmet and and all the fun stuff goes along with this some of us actually turn on logging you know i can tell you everything inbound and outbound on my connections in my box through my logs and my Splunk set up. So um, if you're like us, then, yeah, I'm pretty confident in using it. But look what I have to do to get there. Yeah. <clears throat> and I just do not open attachments. I don't care who you are. You know, I, I, I really have to know that you just sent that to me. And I have VMs that I can, anything questionable, I can dump, dump it off to and expand it there if I'm at all curious. But I'm pretty good at detecting malware. So even if I get infected, I'd, I'd probably more say, whoo, you got me. But what? I would pick it up pretty quick. What's the nastiest malware you've ever dealt with? Can you give us some details about how the system got infected and you know what it was doing to stay persistent? Um, the memory, the in-memory stuff is the most persistent. Another one that's starting to, to root, it's pretty, pretty uncommon. Dave uh, Cowan talked about this in regards to separations of areas on the disk um, and file registry. So Windows has the ability, the malware can utilize and create this custom volume, for lack of a better term where it loads its volume. It's allowed to interact with the system. The system is not allowed to interact with it. So think of it as a little hidden partition that uh, the malware might <coughs> utilize. That would be pretty bad because there aren't any tools right now. Uh, you know, Dave and gang are working on their NTFS related tools and journal tools and things to, to try to find and, and show those locations. But that would be pretty hard. Now, generally, you don't get enough functionality from just that. So you have to have additional DLLs and, and files that you drop somewhere. Um, even the most uh, stealthy stuff that we dealt with that was you know, something that was executed, Windows Temp, launched, deleted immediately, got by several products we won't pick on here, got loaded into memory, 
All it really was is the, the hidden back door. Woke up every so often, phoned home, waited for a command. And then when this thing, when they finally decided they wanted to utilize it, they would open a connection, kind of like a hidden netcat, and then they would take the box over again because they're already in its system level at that point, and they just drop another piece of malware on there. At which point, you know, boom. So those hit soup, those memory only programs are the hard ones. They're the hardest ones to find. You literally got to crawl around your boxes doing memory dumps and doing a comparison of what's normal against them to what's not to be able to find these things yeah. if you want to be proactive at it. And we did this fairly frequently on off hours. <laughs> yeah. We heard that uh, last week in our, in our SANS course. It was like, it was about web applications, but Kevin was saying you got to find what's normal and then, you know, figure out what's not normal and use that to, to, to understand the attack. Yep. So. I mean, once we build a system, it does a function. Now, it may be a mail function, maybe a database function, maybe an app function, but it loads a certain deterministic amount of things. Those things, in the case of one of these pieces of malware that loaded SQL Server, launched in the course of launching SQL Server using DLL injection. They placed the DLL right next to that SQL Server executable, loaded that into memory, calling another DLL in another location, and that part was easily found because we watch for that. And, you know, again, writing to memory, and at that point, you know, you can get rid of all the files you want. When the thing shuts down and comes back up, there it is again, and it's yeah. phone at home. So those are the sneaky parts. So you really have to look at that scenario. And you can't just look at the processes alone. You really have to say, well, what's running under that process? Um, sometimes they run a unique process. All the really crappy malware, generally not highly engineered malware, runs a stupid process that looks like, you know, an NVIDIA video driver or whatever, but it's spelled differently or or it's another occurrence of the same thing. Yeah. Um, and those, you know, again, are more easy to detect. Generally, there's a file, generally the you know, extra process, the funny name. But we see malware now, too, that uh, is using Unicode characters. And uh, I just read about one that uh, used a Unicode characters in between program and files. So when oh. the person looked at the wow. disk, they saw two program file directories because Explorer won't see that. Yeah. So until you dump it out to be able to see what that character is from a, you know, in case or some other tool, you won't realize that a this thing's hidden <coughs> because they hid it, but b that it's that really program files. It's program something Unicode files, and they hide their malware in there. That's an old trick. I used to do that with DOS. I'd be able to go. I I put a directory name with a null spot on the end. Yep. So when somebody goes CD program, yeah, all two fifty five. Yeah, yeah, all two fifty five. That's right. That's right. So there's lots of tricks like that, and, and people need to realize they exist and, and look for those norms, and then filter that out and get rid of the hay and say, okay, what's what's left? What do I have to look at that's left? And eventually, you get to know your environment. And it's, you know, a, a mail server is a mail server is a mail server. The only time it's going to change is when you patch it, <clears throat> and you can monitor for that condition and know that you know at this point in time, the probability of them timing their attack to your patch is pretty low. Um, but if I was clever, that's probably what I'd do. Wait for this to kick off and then do something. Yeah. But if I had to sit there wait for that, my obviously my stuff would be on the box and I would hopefully detect it another way. So having servers that run only a specific job is probably better than having your Exchange server also be your DHCP server, also being your DNS server, also being your web server. That, that definitely would be a good thing for bigger business. Smaller business doesn't have that luxury. But, you know, again, once I build a box from scratch, if I build it completely from scratch and I baseline at that point, and I tweak all my scripts and all my detection stuff that we do, and then I apply that. When I run that check every time, it should pretty much come up blank unless there's a patch. And I know because the guy's patched it. Pretty <coughs> obvious when you're patching boxes, Microsoft kicks off some very unique things, and then you, you monitor for that condition. There's no reason why you can't baseline that. You just People have to know that this is an option. You can do it and just have to learn how to do it. Yeah. Man, that was a great interview. Um, I learned a lot about you know, how malware hides itself inside of systems. I didn't realize that, that Windows was, um, you know, so cagey with the way that, you know, directories were, were scanned. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, and the uh, hiding inside memory and then only uh, placing uh, the malware on the disk after all the other programs have, um, you know, stopped executing that's pretty cool yeah i i sat i, I was kind of dumbfounded when i first heard him talk about the issa thing when they were he's like oh yeah we just fixed the infection by doing a hard boot of you know a, pulling the plug you know, hard yeah yeah just pulling the plug i was like you can't do that that's like anathema to everything you know about a company you <laughs> got to do graceful shutdowns and i was like oh my god 
But I guess I guess if you're you're worried about the data on your computer, that's that's what you want to well, do. I don't know how you would um, not harm your Windows system by pulling the plug like that. I mean, not doing a graceful shutdown. I was always told, you know, ooh, you're gonna have a blue screen or something because your you know your memory's gonna be corrupt or something like that. Yeah. Well, the the other thing is, uh, let's say you are running an enterprise exchange server. You're not going to be running that on a regular hard drive. You're going to running, be running that on a RAID type system. So, scramming the RAID like that without you know gracefully shutting anything down, it you know you could you know kill the infection. But depending on how big your RAID is, it could take days to rebuild that RAID back from scratch. Wow. So you really have to. That really has to be like a last ditch effort if you're going to do anything. Um, I, I would imagine that. You wouldn't really want to do that on, you know, just any machine uh, or at all. I mean, if there's a way of saving the data before you can pull that 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 plug, that's that's definitely worth uh, worth a try before you just go ahead and you know go balls to the wall. On right. That. Hey, did you catch the two terms that he he authored himself? Uh, no, I didn't. W- which ones were you talking uh, about? Malwarians. He refers to the, mal- the oh, you know, the yeah, guys behind the malware as Malwarians. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to start using this other term that he uh, coined, nefarious ne'er do wellers. Nefarious ne'er do well. Well, you know, if he coined it and he, you know, well, I'll ask him. I'll, I'll get his permission. Yeah, you there know. you go. Get a get permission. Yeah, yeah. I- I'm sure he would like more people to use it because you know, if he just yeah. heard it out of the blue somewhere, he'd be like, ah. I know where that came from. Well, you know, if he if we use it, then he'll he'll know that you know, we 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 hold him in high regard. Oh yeah. So he he mentioned a couple of he of course he mentioned his sniper forensic toolkit, but there were a couple of of products that he had talked about. One of them was Bit Nine. Yeah. And Bit Nine's been around for a long time. Actually, uh, they are a, a Massachusetts-based security firm that creates an application that allows for a whitelisting of applications. We heard that some of that during the interview, um, the way that works. Since the interview, and it, that interview literally happened Wednesday, I think, of this week, uh, Bit9 and the other company that he was talking about, Carbon Black, which is a cybersecurity firm here in Austin, Texas, have merged, and they've, they've become one with themselves, you know. Um, and what Carbon Black does is... Does the other part of became one with themselves? I'll have to remember. <laughs> that. That's awesome. All I could think about when I said that was this this motion picture Star Trek with V'ger. Oh, we must merge with the Decca unit. Mm, okay. So, uh, but so what? We will what become carbon? One with ourselves. Yes, you you will be assimilated. Carbon Black is a, another type of IPS or IDS in this case for hosts, and it does. Uh, they call themselves in, instant incident response. They also do uh, pre- uh, detection, and um, whereas Bit Nine does uh, prevention, they do the the front side, and Carbon Black does the back side. So their idea is that they are going to kind of be, they're trying to make themselves the total solution. Bit9 will catch it on the front end. I'm not saying that Bit9 wouldn't catch it on the front end, but should they happen to not catch it on the front end, the idea is that Carbon Black would catch it on the back end. Uh, But literally, as we went to press this afternoon, uh, we found out that they had merged, and for about 30, I want to say 38, was that $38 million or something? They, uh, they joined together, and so they're going to almost double the size of their company, and uh, we wish them the best. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Michael holds him in high regard, so, you know, he's a great guy. Yeah, you notice, you notice during that, that interview, he, he didn't have a lot of positive things to say about many different vendors, but when he got to those two, he he did he did say that they were they were pretty good. So um, he, I've known him for almost a year and a half, and I've you know he that's one of the few these are some of the few companies he does speak about in high regard. So put him in your Twitter account. Follow Michael Goff. The guy is an expert. He knows what he's doing, 
And uh, right. I can't wait to hear the second half of our interview. It yeah, gets better. We, uh, yeah, it gets better. We start talking about uh, um, more about his tool, uh, the upcoming B-sides here, and um, I think we just start riffing on some, from some general ideas. So right. that will be next week. Uh, we'll have a short intro for that and then probably just go directly to the interview. I hope so. Uh, yeah, because yeah, we want to. We really want to get to the content because this is very timely. Um, you know, because we did talk about the breaches. Um, he had mentioned the hotels that were also breached, which I had forgotten about. I'd forgotten that not only do you know retailers use POS systems, but hotels also do as you know for that. So. And I'd like to talk more about Sniper Forensics Toolkit. I want to see uh, what he's got, what he's built, how it works. You know, all that yeah. stuff. So uh, I'm going to do yeah. some. Uh, you know, digging into that as well. Yeah, that sounds good. We should do that. So, All right. Let's get out of here, man. Yes. we. Uh, this is Brian and Brian uh, for Breaking Down Security. Have yourself a great day. Good night. Good night.